Light, nimble and extrovert, the Nissan Duke was the original small super mini derived crossover model, combining attitude, irreverence, modish style and energy with a mischievous sense of fun. Since its original launch, plenty of would-be rivals have attempted to copy its concept, prompting Nissan to introduce this second generation model to try and ensure continued segment leadership. As before, the result certainly won't please everyone, but then that's because it isn't supposed to. It's aimed at the young and the young at heart, many of whom will continue to love this car and admire its designers having the courage to do something different. Very different. There's nothing quite like a Nissan Duke, part SUV, part sports coupe, part hot hatch, with a few bike and rally car jeans thrown in for good measure. It sounds an unpromising mix, but against the odds, Nissan has made it work. And in the original version of this car, defined once and for all what the market's smallest breed of crossover class car should be like. Here's the second generation model. What was so amazing about the original Duke was that a company the size of Nissan could build it. The usual procedure is for a maverick designer to come up with a concept like this, only for company heads to shelve it, for customer clinics to reject it, or for marketing pressure to water it down. Somehow the earlier Duke survived all of these potential trapdoors, and this Mark II model remains equally polarizing. It's arguably still the most distinctive family car on sale today. The original Duke didn't invent the compact crossover segment, but it was very much the car that popularised it. Launched in 2010 and then significantly updated in 2014, over 1.5 million examples of it were sold by the time this second generation version arrived in the autumn of 2019, 285,000 of them in the UK. Under the skin, the engineering is slightly less distinct and varied than that of the old car. That previous model had an adapted platform unique to it, and it offered customers a choice of petrol and diesel power and front or four-wheel drive. This one shares its front-driven only CMFB platform with its cousin and close rival, the Renault Capture. And from launch, there was only one engine also shared with that Renault, a one-litre, three-cylinder petrol unit claimed to be 15% faster and 30% cleaner than its DIGT unit predecessor. But all the stuff that you'll really care about is distinct. The look, obviously, and the claimed sporty handling, both of which come with British influence. Now, the Duke was styled at Nissan's European Design Centre in Paddington, London, and it was developed at the brand's R&D facility in Cranfield. It's also built on these shores in Wearside, near Sunderland. This second generation model won't command its market segment quite as imperiously as its predecessor did. There are now too many strong competitors crammed into this class for that. But so much bigger is this sector now. Uh, sales in this class are expected to grow by 30% over the next couple of years that it might well sell just as strongly as the original if Nissan has made this car feel as special and as individual as the old model was, yet kept its sporty feel and its relatively practical nature. Has that happened here? Well, that's what we're going to be finding out. Dynamically, the Duke has a wider brief to fulfill than the usual one allotted to a small crossover model of this kind, as well as competing with lifestyle oriented little SUVs like Renault's Capture and Peugeot's 2008. It must also appeal to extrovert, style conscious small car buyers who might otherwise buy something sportier, a mini hatch perhaps, or maybe even something like a Mazda MX-5. That means it's got to handle, which is quite an ask for something with a short, tall stance and the extra weight of an SUV. Still, as you begin to realise after a few miles with this Duke on twisting secondary roads, the cleverness of modern engineering means that unpromising statistics like those can still be converted into a car that delivers a satisfying steer, something helped here by a 13% improvement in torsional rigidity brought out by this second generation model's new CMFB platform, which presumably is the main reason why body roll is slightly better controlled this time around. 
drive this Nissan in a way that few typical owners ever would, and you'll find that, aided by now more responsive steering, it hangs on tenaciously through the turns. If not quite Ford Puma-like, certainly in a way that makes most other segment rivals feel compromised and bland. As with that Ford, there is a torque vectoring package to help here. Uh, Nissan calls its system active trace control, and as usual with this kind of feature, subtle brake pressure is applied to the front wheels at speed through the turns. Now this loads up the front of the car and pushes the tyres more firmly into the tarmac and it increases their bite on the road. As a result, uh, Nissan's marketing spiel says that roundabouts will become your playgrounds. We're not really sure how the local constabulary would feel about that though. Nissan has had to adopt a pretty stiff suspension setup to make all that work. Uh, too stiff you might feel if you've opted for the big 19 inch wheels that come fitted to the top Tecna models. You really need to try it before you buy here, particularly if, as is likely, your Duke will mainly be used on suburban duties. With the 16 or 17 inch rims of the lesser variants so, though, the damping balance offers a more bearable compromise and it's helped by the way that the suspension setup has been retuned for this Mark II model with smaller secondary springs housed within the dampers to cushion rebound strokes as you drive over bumps. That combines with standard active ride control which immediately after you've hit a pothole or a tarmac tear gently applies brake pad to brake disc usually at the rear so as to ease back body pitch and make the car more stable. Now you'll particularly notice this working over speed bumps. A meteor set of rubber is a key part of this Duke's rejuvenated handling suspension package. And Nissan says that the standard Bridgestones offer the same grip and traction as the wider tyres that used to be fitted to the old high performance Duke Nismo model. Uh, it's unlikely that we'll see a souped up Nismo version of this one though. In fact from launch uh, the Duke was given no performance pretensions at all. Buyers were restricted to a single one litre three cylinder DIG. GT turbo unit with 117 PS. This unit does have a satisfyingly perky note but a perhaps inevitable paucity of pulling power. It doesn't really feel like you've got up to 200 newton meters of it beneath your right foot when you're powering up a steep incline. Still that is also the case with virtually all entry-level petrol power plants used in small SUVs of this kind and with this Duke you get the performance of a mid-range engine for the price that other brands will charge you for a feebler entry-level unit. Hence the reasonably rapid quoted 10.4 second 0 to 62 miles an hour sprint time, although the top speed is modest at 112 miles an hour. We've had quite a lot of experience with this little three-cylinder DIGT 999cc engine, a unit co-developed with Daimler that pops up in products as diverse as the Renault Clio, the Dacia Duster and the Nissan Micra. You'll also find it in the car that shares that new CMFB platform we mentioned earlier, this Duke's close SUV cousin, the Renault Capture, although there this power plant's offered in a lesser 100 PS state of tune. Uh, since that car also features plug-in hybrid tech, it's a fair bet that a PHEV Duke will be on the cards uh, for later on in this design's production. Uh, for the time being though, it's one litre DIGT petrol power or nothing, certainly no diesel option. Uh, an SUV B segment bar wouldn't be seen dead filling from the black pump these days. The only choice that Duke buyers do get in this regard is whether the petrol unit in question is paired with a six-speed manual gearbox, which is quite slick but has a slightly overlong throw, or this alternative seven-speed automatic we've been trying here. An automatic Duke is another confection that we'd highly recommend uh, that you sample extensively before commitment. Now in theory, because the self-shifting box is of the DCT dual clutch type, it ought to be smooth and seamless to use. We found it reluctant to kick down and its change is a little slothful though, even when prompted by the uh, provided steering wheel paddles. Overtakes need planning well in advance. That might not necessarily be a problem for the type of buyer who will want an automatic Duke. More of an issue for those folk though could be the way that this car jerks away from rest when you engage drive unless you're really very delicate with the throttle. You learn to work around this and you'll need to if you want this car with the autonomous driving elements of Nissan's Pro Pilot camera safety package because these only work with automatic transmission. 
whatever your choice of gearbox, provided you avoid the humblest trim levels to suit the current segment trend, you'll get a set of drive settings and they're accessed via this D mode button just below the gear stick. Although we're not quite sure after that initial sampling that you'll be using them all that often. Um, Eco makes the throttle seem somewhat treacly, while Sport rather overweights the steering. Best then to stay in the compromise standard setting, which rather defeats the whole point of having the D mode option in the first place. What else? Um, well, you wouldn't expect a four-wheel drive option in this class of SUV, and you can't have any sort of grip control style traction system either. In fact, any sort of off-tarmac excursion in this crossover would probably be extremely unwise. As to the highway, well, apart from a bit of whistling from the turbocharger and some wind noise around these mirrors, uh, refinement is really quite reasonable at cruising speed, so you could happily use your Duke for the kind of longer trips where the uh, ride quality caveats that we mentioned earlier really won't be too much of a problem. Like its predecessor though, this Nissan is at its happiest over shorter hops. It remains a concoction that one writer once likened to a kind of shrunken SUV sports car in super springy trainers. Uh, that about sums it up, we think. And if that sounds appealing, then for you, a Duke might well be too. Yes, the Duke does still look like either something dredged up from the abyssal depths of the ocean or a fun, friendly little runabout that's rather futuristic. It all depends on your perspective. Whichever camp you're in, you have to hand it to Nissan for not losing its resolve here. It would have been so easy for them to water this design down so as to reach a wider audience. But as it is, buyers of the original model will immediately recognize this second generation version with its exaggerated wheel arches, its rising window line, its strong shoulders and its squat rear end. All of which artfully disguises a slight size increase over what we had before. It's 29 millimeters wider and 75 mils longer. Encountering the original Duke for the first time gave you the feeling of meeting something from a movie, uh, Disney Pixar's Cars film perhaps. Uh, this one is a little more Judge Dredd, but it still continues to make more of a style statement than any other remotely family-friendly five-door you can buy for sensible money. Either side of Nissan's trademark V-Motion grille, you still get these huge headlights, uh, which on the original model were styled on rally car fog lights, but they're now out more sophisticated with full LED beams that display with a Y-shaped signature and more importantly they boost visibility range by 10 meters. Redesigned and much slimmer side lights now sit just above them to further emphasize the rather stern appearance uh, having been moved from the previous rather odd position on top of the bonnet. Uh, from the side, the dimensions, 4.2 metres of length, continue to place this model halfway between a super mini and a family hatch in terms of size, but the profile perspective is a little different. Now, previously, it had a bit of a beach buggy style look, dominated by cartoonishly curvaceous panelwork curves above the wheel arches. Now, that's been replaced by this sweeping swage line that flows from the chunky rear haunches aggressively down towards the front wing. And the so-called floating roof can, as here, be contrast coloured. In this case, it's Fuji Red, although you only get that roof colour choice as standard with the priciest Techna Plus top level of trim. If you're happy to pay for that top spec model, uh, further matching colour personalisation can be added to the mirror caps, uh, to the side sill strips, the rear diffuser and to little tick flicks under the front fog lights. Whatever kind of body finish you prefer, visually, as ever with the Duke, it's still a stylistic tale of two halves. The bottom section of the car, all SUV with its black clad arches and lower bodywork that emerges from underneath, resembling underbody protection. Above the waistline, though, the sports car DNA shines through. It's almost as if Nissan had bolted the top half of its GTR Super Coupe to the bottom half of a Qashqai crossover and shrunk the resulting concoction in the wash. Now to suit this kind of stance, the alloy rims are big of course, or at least they need to be. Uh, the entry-level Vizier version looks a 
little glum with its weedy 15 inch rims. Ideally you'll need 17 or 18 inches or even uh, 19 inch diamond cut Akari rims like we have here for proper pavement presence. At the back, the glass angle is more steeply raked and the boot aperture has widened because the rear lights are now mounted partly on the tailgate rather than completely occupying the corners of the bodywork. Uh, more significant, of course, is what you can't see. Now, previously, this model's platform differed quite a lot from that of its Renault-Nissan Alliance cousin, the Renault Capture, but this time around, uh, both cars feature the same CMFB chassis uh, that the conglomerate now uses for all its current compact models. That's delivered a significant 13% improvement in torsional rigidity, and it's contributed to a weight reduction of 23 kilos. But will it be just as interesting inside? Now the original Duke's interior was, but it let itself down with cheap feeling materials that felt increasingly Fisher Price like as its production run drew to an end. This one of course is of much higher quality as you realise immediately from the way that the door clunks shut. Although perhaps it isn't quite as striking as the previous model in terms of design. Gone is the superbike fuel tank style lower centre console and the door armrest shaped like uh, scuba diving flippers. But as you can see, it's potentially just as personalisable, particularly if you specify all the optional bright trimming that we have here. And there are no longer any basic ergonomic errors. Uh, the sporty looking monoform seats with their integrated headrests position you a little higher up than in some direct rivals. And that'll please those with dodgy hips. And at last, the wheel now adjusts for reach as well as height. Oh, and the gear lever, that's now a fraction closer to the driver. Certainly, uh, a previous owner might initially miss the old model's quirkiness, but we think that they'd quickly appreciate its replacement's more robust surfaces, the slicker switch gear, and the way that the ambient lighting highlights key areas at night. Plus, the details are now much better executed. These lovely round turbine-style uh, middle and corner vents, for example. And there are still a few fun touches, uh, like the ambient lighting ring around the gear selector. That's an idea that was borrowed from Mini. Uh, plus, extroverts will love the way that with top spec Techno Plus trim, everything can be trimmed very brightly. In this case, with stitched trimming in Vivid Energy Orange for the upholstery, the door cards, uh, the lower centre console, the lid of the box between the seats and the central part of the fascia. The richer materials you get with the personalisation packs available with this top trim level obviously help with the perception of greater quality, like Sways of Alcantara with the Enigma Black package, or Syntec Leather with the alternative light grey pack. Plusher models also feature this stitched leather instrument binnacle top, although finishing like that might be better employed to cover areas that you touch rather more often, like the harder plastic used on top of the door cards here for example. A little surprisingly, Nissan isn't offering a set of Duriger digital instrument binnacle virtual dials even as an option, but the provided analog gauges that you view through this relatively small D-shaped three-spoke steering wheel are clear and separated by a good-sized screen, uh, and that imparts the usual fuel economy, uh, car info, compass, audio and driver assistance information. Anything that this screen can't tell you will be covered off by this center dash screen. Now this now stands proud of the top of the fascia rather than being integrated into it. And it has of course gone up a size to suit this more spacious cabin. The Nissan says that uh, according to its research, over two thirds of buyers thought that car interiors should be better connected. So this one is apparently the most connected Nissan ever. This 8-inch Nissan Connect screen is standard, providing you avoid entry-level trim, and it's equipped with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, plus voice control, uh, Nissan Connect live information services, and a rear-view camera. It can even show a virtual analog clock, and it allows you to check on the current or future weather forecast. 
From mid-range and connector spec, uh, you get TomTom Tom Navigation 2, and in-car Wi-Fi can also be specified. Uh, this display is a useful improvement over what was offered before, but the clarity of the menus and the speed of its response times still can't quite match those of rival Volkswagen Group models. Plus, uh, some of the icons are a little small to accurately hit on the move. Across the range, there's a Nissan Connect app, which allows you to interact with your Duke from wherever you are using your smartphone. It gives you drive data or accesses your favorite music. Plus, the newly added Google Assistant compatibility allows you to preload navigation instructions into your phone that you can then uh, just click into the car once you reach it. Plusher Technotrim upgrades the Nissan Connect Screen's DAV audio system to Bose Personal Plus surround status. And that means you get these ultra near field speakers built into both front seat headrests, meaning that the risk of extraneous noise intrusion is minimized. Uh, the system isn't especially powerful, but we've found it delivers the promised immersive stereo feel. What else might you need to know? Um, well, we talked earlier about seat positioning. It's good that these front chairs can be adjusted over a wide range of height, so you can either hunker down or you can enjoy a more commanding view over the creased bonnet ahead. But it's less pleasing that they can't be had with adjustable lumbar support to stop you from slouching on longer journeys. Sit up high and you'll have a really great view at junctions and at roundabouts, and that's further aided by these slim front A pillars. But thanks to the chunky rear pillars and the small rear screen, it's a very different story when it comes to uh, looking over your shoulder. Hence, presumably, Nissan's decision to include a standard rear view camera above entry level trim, and that's upgraded on the Technospec models to a 360 60 degree surround view monitor. Storage provision is fine, although the glove box isn't as big as it initially looks. Uh, Nissan has forgotten to provide an overhead compartment for your sunglasses, and this deep central bin here doesn't have any plug points that would allow you to charge your phone away from prying eyes. Uh, surprisingly, you can't specify a wireless charging mat either, so charging has to be done uh, with your handset in this recess down here at the bottom of the center stack, which has a USB port and a 12 volt socket just above. Uh, there are also deep cup holders here between the seats and reasonably sized door bins too, each with a bottle holder. Right. Let's take a look out back. Now the rear doors, like those in a Toyota CHR, are accessed via these high set handles. Cramped rear seat accommodation was a real drawback with the first generation version of this Duke. You'd hope that lengthening the wheelbase by 105 millimeters would have improved things. It has. Now Nissan talks of an extra 58 millimeters of legroom back here this time around. And that's enough in this case to make the difference between what previously felt very much like a kids only space and one that now feels like it could take a couple of adults for short to medium length journeys without upsetting them too much. Uh, the designers could have gone further, of course. Uh, there is 11 millimeters more headroom, but it's still merely adequate, really. And unlike in, say, a rival Renault Capture or a Volkswagen T-Cross, you don't get a sliding seat base. Still, the brand hopes you'll be distracted by showy design touches. Uh, the strange shiny black casing for the back of the front head restraints, for example. And if you've opted for one of the uh, personalization packs, these bright door trim panels. Younger folk will be pleased to find a USB port pack here uh, near this central cubby. And the central transmission tunnel isn't too high. So if you really do have to squeeze in a third person, that ought to be possible without the central occupant here needing a trip to the osteopath afterwards. It's too much to expect a central armrest or an overhead reading light with this class of car, but there are small door bins with bottle holders, uh, seat back pockets, and you get a grab handle coat hook here on the left. Let's finish with a look at the boot. And uh, now the original Duke's trunk was ridiculously small, but the updated 2014 era version improved things. And now we've reached the point where this Nissan can be said to be class competitive in terms of luggage space. Uh, the 422 litre capacity is 20% greater than what was on offer before. 
To give you some class perspective, that's 22 litres more than you'll get in the Skoda Kamiq and 45 litres more than is offered by a Toyota CHR. But it is about 33 litres down on what you get in a Ford Puma or in a Volkswagen T-Cross and 114 litres less than you get in a Renault Captur. Six carry-on cases will fit below the load cover, which is as many as you can get into the brand's supposedly larger Qashqai SUV. Uh, a Puma or a T-Cross will take up to eight. It helps that this is a practical space. It's 29 millimeters wider than the cargo area of the previous generation Duke. Now we mentioned earlier that the rear lamps now split between the tailgate and the corners of the bodywork. That's enabled the hatch aperture to be 131 millimeters wider. Plus there's a usefully low loading lip too. You get this standard adjustable height floor, which in its lowest setting will allow you to carry some uh, quite tall items. Below the cargo base, uh, there's this further compartmentalized area, although only because Nissan isn't offering any sort of space saver spare wheel, just this fiddly tire repair kit. Uh, there are a couple of bag hooks, but curiously, the usual tie down points are absent. Um, if you need more room, you can push down the 6040 split rear bench to free up 1305 litres of capacity across a completely flat load area if you have the adjustable height floor in its higher position. The days are long gone when you could buy a small SUV of this kind from around £15,000. Now this Duke does remain one of the better value compact crossovers, but from launch, buyers were still looking at a starting price of around £18,000, and that's for the base Vizier variant that few will want. Most will be looking to begin their perusal of the Duke range from slightly plusher Accenta trim, which means you'll need to be starting off with a budget of around £20,000. A couple of thousand more will get you mid-range N connector spec, and then around £23,000 upgrades you to plusher Techna trim. And this top Techna Plus variant, that's the one that you'll need for a complete set of personalization options, will cost you the best part of £25,000. Trendy SUVs really Really aren't for the poor of pocket, but you probably knew that already. Now from launch there was just uh, this single petrol engine on offer, a 1 litre DIGT 117 PS 3 cylinder petrol turbo unit, but buyers wanting an alternative to the standard 6 speed manual gearbox are offered the option of a 7 speed automatic transmission for an extra £1,500. Now we do expect Nissan to offer a plug-in hybrid option later in this model's production cycle, but that was some way off at the time of this test. You'll be wanting to know how this car's pricing compares to obvious rivals in the segment. Well, back in 2010, uh, the Duke had just two segment competitors. At the time of the launch of this second generation version, though, in 2019, that number had grown to no fewer than 24. So how does it stack up against them? Well, pretty well as it turns out, which helps explain why our market accounts for around a quarter of Nissan's global Duke sales. Now with entry level trim, uh, this Nissan can undercut base versions of the Renault Capture, the Volkswagen T-Cross, the Skoda Kamiq and the Seat Arona by around 500 to 750 pounds. A base Citroen C3 Air Cross would cost around 1500 pounds more and a base Vauxhall Crossland X or Peugeot 2008 around two and a half thousand pounds more. Drill down into the detail with each of these cars and the value proposition gets better still from Nissan's point of view. Now all the models I just mentioned have engines feebler than the 1 litre DIGT 117 PS unit featuring this Duke. To match this three cylinder power plant's turbo performance you'd have to stump up for a more powerful engine in all of the small SUVs we just referenced which of course will mean paying quite a lot more. Uh, let's take just one example. The next engine up in this model's cousin, the Renault Capture, uh, a TCE 130 petrol unit, costs well over £21,000 in its most affordable form. And around £21,000 to £22,000 is about par for the course for comparably powerful versions of the Volkswagen T-Cross, the Skoda Kamiq and the Seat Arona, which is also the kind of budget that you'll need for another car which a potential Duke buyer might have on their shopping list, the Ford Puma. You'll need quite a lot more than that 
that for comparably powerful versions of the Citroen, the Vauxhall and the Peugeot SUV models we mentioned earlier. And if you're a potential Duke buyer, you might also have had your eye on a Toyota CHR. If so, well, you'll have to bear in mind that pricing on one of those doesn't even start until you get above the £26,000 price point. Of course, we haven't yet given you an exhaustive list of all the other cars in the growing small SUV B segment. Uh, the two Korean class entries, Kia's Stonic and Hyundai's Kona, they are comparably priced against the Duke. But the 1 litre TGDI 120 PS petrol engine, which both those cars use, isn't as perky as that of this Nissan. And neither a Stonic nor a Kona feel anything like as good as this Duke when you're pushing on through those bends. Uh, models like the Mazda CX-30, the Jeep Renegade, uh, the Audi Q2, the Honda HRV, and even Suzuki's Vitara and S-Cross models are all fractionally bigger and quite a lot pricier. Ford's Echo Sport, uh, the DS3 Crossback, the Fiat 500X, and the Mitsubishi ASX are clunkier to drive and they're pricier to run. And the MG ZS, the Sangyong Tivoli and the Dacia Duster, although uh, they're cheaper than this Nissan to buy, feel a lot cheaper inside. They're less personalizable and again, are nothing like as good as this Duke to drive. Having considered all that, we can understand why you might be quite set on this Nissan. And if so, uh, the deal might be sealed if the brand were able to be generous in terms of standard specification. So is that the case? Well, let's see. Now, you wouldn't expect to get any of the real niceties with base Vizier trim, and you don't. But even at that level, there is a rear spoiler, LED tail lamps, and full LED headlamps with follow me home functionality. So they stay illuminated to guide you to your front door at night. Inside, you get monoform sporty seats with height adjustment for the driver, cruise control with a speed limiter and a four-speaker DAB audio system with Bluetooth connectivity and a 4.2-inch uh, TFT centre display. Most Duke bars will want to complete the look of the cabin with the Nissan Connect 8-inch central touchscreen. And for that, you'll have to start your search in the range from Accenture trim. Now, that upgraded display is well worth the price of admission. It incorporates Apple CarPlay and Google Android Auto smartphone mirroring, plus Wi-Fi, a rear view camera, voice recognition, and various Nissan Connect media services. Uh, Accenture trim also gets you the luggage board, and that's an adjustable height boot floor and much smarter 17 inch alloy wheels. The really desirable kit though starts with mid-range end connector trim. Here you get a rear privacy glass along with a uh, shark fin roof antenna and the cabin's upgraded with leather for the steering wheel and the gear knob. Plus there's ambient lighting, there's automatic climate control and a seven inch full color TFT screen combi meter for the instrument binnacle. In addition, end connector spec gets you Nissan Connect navigation with TomTom traffic information, an electronic handbrake, uh, Nissan's intelligent key keyless entry system and D mode drive modes which offer a choice of standard eco or sport settings to adjust the response of the car depending on the road or the driver's mood. The Duke variants that you're really going to want though bear Tecna badges and they're recognisable by larger 19 inch wheels. Uh, the standard Tecna model comes with the Bose Personal Plus audio system with its ultra near field speakers built into both front seat headrests. Plus it includes heated front seats, a thermoclear heated windscreen and a couple of extra useful driving features. Uh, there's an intelligent around view monitor with a 360 degree colour camera to help with low speed manoeuvring and intelligent cruise control to help on the highway. Now this tailors your speed to that of the surrounding traffic. Technospec also includes an advanced safety shield pack with a range of extra camera safety features that we'll cover off in just a moment. 
Here though we have the top Tecna Plus model, recognisable by the eye-catching Akari design of its 19-inch wheels and by a satin silver front bumper finisher. As mentioned earlier, Tecna Plus is the trim level that you'll need for a complete set of this Duke's key personalisation options. Uh, as standard, it includes a two-tone metallic paint finish package that gives you the choice of various contrast colours for the roof. Uh, specific shades depend on your chosen body colour. In this case, we have Fuji red but you could also have the top in pearl black or blade silver now uniquely with this top variant uh, the color personalization is also carried forward to the mirror caps the side sill strips the rear diffuser and little tick flicks under the front fog lights additionally Tecna plus trim is the only spec level in the range that allows you to have something that most Duke folk will really want an interior personalization pack now there are three of these to choose from. The Enigma Black Pack features black Alcantara and leather finishing. The Light Grey Pack sees black fabric blended with Syntec man-made leather. Or as in this case, the vibrant Energy Orange Pack will please extroverts with eye-catching black leather juxtaposed against bright orange detailing. Now it is a pity that few of these key personalization options are available on lesser Duke variants. You can specify the contrast roof colors from end connector trim upwards, but once you've paid for that, you might as well have stretched to the higher trim level anyway. And you won't be able to have either an interior personalization pack or the extra body color additions on uh, anything other than a Tecna Plus model. So if you are shopping further down the range, don't even bother to ask about that. Still, uh, there are various other accessories that you can add into your Duke. Uh, now with base Vizier trim, you'll be able to option in larger 17 inch alloy wheels to replace the poverty spec 16 inch steel rims that are otherwise supplied. And across the range, uh, you can add in illuminated door sill strips, an interior light kit and velour mats. As for practicalities, well, you can add front and rear mud guards and a removable tow bar, uh, to which you can also add a bike carrier. If you add the aluminium load carrying roof bars, you can also fit a medium sized roof box or a roof mounted bike carrier. Now for the boot, uh, you might want the reversible trunk liner and for the interior, you might want a set of rubber floor mats, a duo plus child seat or indeed a magnetic smartphone holder. So let's finish with a look at safety provision and brief you on the fact that all Duke models come with a strong standard of camera safety kit. You'd expect any modern family car these days to have emergency brake, autonomous braking fitted across the range and this one does, including Nissan's intelligent emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist recognition package. Now as usual with this kind of feature, it's one of those setups that scans the road ahead looking for potential accident hazards as you drive and it will automatically apply the brakes if need be to avoid a potential collision. Uh, also standard across the range is lane departure warning and also lane departure prevention. Nissan also calls this intelligent lane intervention. Now this will use steering assist to ease you back into your lane if you stray away from it. Uh, there is also a high beam assist feature Now that will dip your headlights for you at night and traffic sign recognition now that will picture road signs that you pass speed limit signs that is and display them on the dash for you now this duke also includes an emergency call system now that will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact gps location if the airbags go off in an accident more familiar safety features include a tyre pressure monitoring system, hill start assist and active trace control that helps you to get the power down through tight bends at speed. Plus, as you'd expect, there are twin front, side and curtain airbags, along with a couple of rear Isofix child seat anchorage points with top tethers. Uh, a vehicle dynamics control system marshals the usual electronic features, uh, the usual ABS system with a brake assist, which flashes the hazard signals in emergency stops, an ESP stability system and the normal assistance for traction control. For longer trips you can set a timer alert to prompt you to stop for a break. 
If you want more, you'll have to upgrade yourself to one of the two Technospec models. As mentioned earlier, these come with Nissan's Advanced Safety Shield pack of extra camera features, which, by the way, are optional with mid-range and connector spec. Now, there are four core ones. Uh, for the first time on a Nissan, there's blind spot warning, blind spot intervention. Now, that's there to alert you if you're just about to dangerously pull out to overtake when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. Uh, there is also a driver attention alert intelligent driver alertness feature now that will monitor your driving reactions for drowsiness and if necessary it'll also prompt you to stop for a restorative coffee uh, rear cross traffic alert that will warn you of oncoming vehicles uh, when you're reversing out of a parking space and moving object detection that works with the rear view camera when you're maneuvering at low speeds to detect when something is coming into your blind spot Spot that you couldn't normally see. Uh, a small dog running across the rear of the car when you're reversing, for example. Now, if you've specified your Duke with DCT automatic transmission, then you'll also get Nissan's Traffic Jam Pilot System. Now, that will allow the car to effectively drive itself in low-speed traffic queues, taking care of the steering, the brakes, and the throttle for you. It's a feature that regular commuters will come to depend on. With the original Duke, there was quite a price step up from the base version with the inefficient 1.6 litre petrol engine to a variant with the brand's much more frugal DIG T-Tech. But there's no need to worry about that this time around with the single engine policy that Nissan chose to adopt from launch. The three-cylinder 999cc turbo petrol DIGT unit is, as expected, slightly more efficient when it's mated to manual transmission. Uh, the WLTP figures are 47.9 mpg on the combined cycle and 135 grams per kilometre of CO2. But there's not a lot in it. With the seven-speed DCT auto we're trying here, the official returns are 46.3 miles per gallon and 138 grams per kilometre. And that should give you a reasonable range from the 46 litre fuel tank. To give you some class perspective on those readings, uh, let's tell you that they are almost identical to the returns that you would get from a base entry-level petrol version of this car's cousin, the Renault Capture, and they're also very similar to the readings quoted for rival 1-litre TSI petrol versions of the VW Group's offerings in the sector, the Volkswagen T-Cross, the Seat Arona and the Skoda Kamiq. But there are more frugal and cleaner class options. Uh, thanks to its mild hybrid tech, Ford's Puma is slightly more efficient, as are PSA Group, Peugeot, Citroën, Vauxhall and DS models in this segment too. Although in those cases, it's mainly because those cars are slightly lighter than this Nissan. This second generation Duke may tip the scales around 23 kilos lighter than its predecessor, but it still weighs in at around 1.2 tonnes. So that you can maximise your returns, Nissan offers a variety of driver orientated tools. If your Duke has the D mode drive setting system, you'll be able to select Eco, which uh, will slightly restrict throttle response and climate system output. And you can also select Eco options for the cruise control, the stop start system, and for the air conditioning. With Eco mode settings, there's also a view history screen option, and that graphically shows the fuel consumption achieved. Uh, both the best that you've achieved and for the journey that you've just completed. Usefully, this can be programmed to flash up in the instrument binnacle whenever you power down at the end of a trip. What about other running cost issues? Uh, well, service intervals come around every 12 months or 12,500 miles, whichever comes soonest. Uh, the instrument binnacle screen allows you to check on various maintenance issues relating to oil, filters and tyres. And as part of any Nissan dealer visit with your car, you'll be provided with a video health check for your Duke that you can watch on your phone or on your computer. Uh, Nissan also provides an unremarkable three-year, 60,000-mile warranty, which can be lengthened to four years, but with the same mileage cap. Now, this recognises that most drivers of small crossovers tend to cover lower distances, but it aims to give added peace of mind for those who are looking to keep their car for longer. And in case of any problems, there's breakdown assistance with roadside help included with the car's protection package. 
what else? Uh, well, your first year VED payment will be £150 and you'll have a competitive BIK benefited kind taxation rating with this car of 26%. Looking further down the line, uh, residual values will obviously be key and independent experts reckon that this Duke will perform a little better than its predecessor in this regard. Uh, Cap HPI reckon that after three years and 30,000 miles, a Duke with either base Vizier spec or top Technotrim will still be worth 48% of its original asking price. And for the mid-range Accenta and N Connector grades, the respective figures are 47 and 46%. That is about 11 percentage points higher than an equivalent version of the previous generation model. As for insurance, well, the mainstream models are rated at Group 13E. Uh, for the Techno variants, though, it's Group 14E. The Duke was always a clever idea, launched by Nissan to offer SUV-like style for the small car sector without any SUV-like compromises. Precisely the same trick that the company's bigger Qashqai crossover had already pulled off in targeting larger family-sized models in the market segment above. There's no point, though, in starting a trend if you're not prepared to develop it. And in the face of increasing competition, this car needed to evolve. It has. We're disappointed that some of the motorcycle style touches of the original model are gone and that it's necessary to stretch to the very top of the range to get the key personalization and safety features. Uh, we're not particularly convinced by the automatic gearbox option and we also think that some target buyers might find the ride to be a little firm. Otherwise though, there's much to like here. In answer to crossover rivals that are more spacious inside and which claim to be cleverer and more efficient, Nissan has given this second bestseller a slightly more mature outlook on life with much higher cabin quality, more rear seat and boot space and a more efficient mainstream engine. Plus a dose of cutting edge media and safety tech too, all without appreciably diluting this car's strong value proposition or creating an appreciably different product. If you liked the Duke before, you'll love it even more now. If though it was a little extrovert for you in its original form, it still won't be to your taste and you'll probably want something similar that's a little more restrained, maybe say a Peugeot 2008 or perhaps a Volkswagen T-Cross. A Duke is different. Very different, in fact, if you choose all the trendy personalization options that are now on offer. In fact, its whole success is founded on just that, being refreshingly different. According to Nissan, this car remains a unique blend of SUV and sports car, a macho alternative to a super mini for youthful urban motorists, roomy yet compact, robust yet dynamic, and practical yet playful. It remains an unusual proposition with an appeal that extends beyond the small crossover segment and which also attracts the kind of buyers who might otherwise consider trendy small runabouts like Fiat's new 500 and the Mini Hatch. Duke buyers think that this car makes urban trinkets like those look rather dull and compromised. Not everyone will agree, but one thing's absolutely for sure. This is an original in every sense.